Good morning, everyone. Buna ziwa tuturor and welcome to a new lecture within our course in EU policy and policy making at Alexandru Yankuza University in Yash. And today we've got with us a very special guest. His name is Fabio Franchino, and he's an expert in European Union politics and in particular in executive politics in, in, in the European Union. He's the author of a very important book, The Powers of the Union, published by Cambridge University Press on delegation uh, on executive uh, of the European Union. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio, for being with us. Okay, we've got now 24 simultaneous connections on YouTube. I ask you please to write your, your name or say hello to our to our guest Fabio Fabio Franchino who today will be discussing about a very current topic very important topic he will be discussing about fiscal discipline about Italy and about European Union oversight in the eurozone of fiscal uh, discipline by member state governments so the the topic today is very important for italy you will probably know that a new government has been appointed in italy it's a very uh, european uh, government now in italy but this is not restricted to italy this affects to the whole european union and the eurozone in particular and other countries such as Spain are already publishing on the cover pages of the newspapers that what is happening in Italy now is um, an indication of what they can expect in, in Spain as well about this EU oversight of fiscal discipline uh, in the current situation that's a situation of economic crisis so without any further ado uh, uh, Fabio, thank you, thank you very much, Fabio Franchino, professor at the University of Milan in Italy. Please tell us a little bit about this new issue about fiscal discipline and EU oversight. Seminar, um, please do interrupt me while I'll talk about this topic because it, it might sound a, a little bit technical. I'll try to make it simple, uh, but I, I hope that you appreciate the importance of this, um, of this topic um, since it is a, a, a fundamental pillar in the um, in how the, the economic. Just, just a second, Fabio. People are, are, are telling me on Facebook that they cannot hear you. So I will make some adjustments here. I don't know because here on the on the control panel that I have it. It says that the, the uh, yes, I see what's happening now. Let me check this, 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 and this. This is so good. What well, we have live uh, interventions by people on on YouTube. So the, a question for the people who are watching now. Dakaneo zitz bine varok. Să ne spuneți, acum vom încerca cu eh, domnul Fabio Franchino din nou. Come on, Fabio. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Can can the students from YouTube can they hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I proceed. Please do let me know if there are problems, and and you know, I'm happy to repeat it to interrupt. Okay. Excellent. So uh, just a brief recap of what I've said so far. Um, um, so the objective of this uh, brief talk, and I would like to thank uh, Diego and for inviting me here, and also you know I would like to say hi to all the students. And please do interrupt me if you have any questions, any issues, so that we we can make this uh, seminar a little bit interact more interactive. Uh, the objective of this uh, um, brief presentation is to discuss um, one of the most important uh, uh, policies that is flanking the uh, European, the Economic and Monetary Union, um, which is about the role of the European Union in overseeing monitoring national fiscal policies. And uh, you might imagine that this has, been, this has been historically very important, and now it is also particularly important in light of the fledging and, and developing uh, European Union-wide fiscal policy. Um, the two things are really complementary to each other, and to the extent to which one works well, I think it's important to lend credibility on how um, the more, um, let's say, expenditure-related EU-wide fiscal policy works. So this is, a, in a, my view, a very important aspect of how economic policy operates at the European Union. Uh, let me briefly start with giving you a bit of an historical overview of, of economic policy in Europe since the early 1990s. Um, the way the European Union was designed in the Treaty of Maastricht, um, as you probably most of you are aware, uh, they established a timetable to uh, set up um, a common currency by the end of that decade, the, the end of the 1990s. And they had, uh, there was a particular section in the um, Treaty of Maastricht that provided for a procedure to oversee uh, national fiscal spending. And that procedure was, and it's still now called, the excessive deficit procedure. So it's a, it was a procedure to make sure that there was not excessive deficit spending at the national level, because for um, Eurozone state excessive deficit spending, might have led to significant negative, in economics they are called negative externalities, which means that essentially there would have been significant negative consequences for other um, fellow um, Eurozone member countries. For economic reasons that I do not get too much into specific here, but especially, but th that was the rationale behind this idea in this uh, um, important um, policy. Now, the European Union was, uh, the Economic and Monetary Union, sorry, was uh, strongly criticized by economists for the fact that it really lacked a, a European Union wide fiscal policy. Essentially, the policy was designed to be, in, uh, you know, he had a, a common monetary policy, yet uh, it, it established a monitoring mechanism for overseeing national spending, might really lack. Um, a European, a, a proper, let's say, extensive European Union-wide um, fiscal policy. There is a reason behind that, because it is very likely that a prerequisite for establishing a EU-wide fiscal policy was uh, uh, to establish, first of all, a credible policy that would oversee national spending. It, what I mean by that is that uh, you need to, first of all, to make uh, to design a policy that properly oversee how um, uh, member states of the European Union spend their money, and if that it were properly, that would be uh, would be generate, let's say, trust in how member states spend their money, and then that would be um, a precondition for them for the developing of a European Union wide. Okay, so let, let me policy. let me interrupt now, just yes. to let you know that. The number of people watching on, on YouTube has increased to 32 now. If this is going very well. They all say that they can they can hear very well now. I'm very I'm very happy with this. And if I, I, I just ask you a question about what we are discussing now. So you say that historically, this uh, fiscal um, oversight 
uh, is, is linked to the common currency project and the, the idea is to afford greater credibility to the project, right? Yes, I mean, the, the rationale behind the development of this policy is that, uh, you know, we do know, I mean, this is basic macroeconomics, we do know that uh, um, fiscal spending, fiscal policy has uh, consequences for the way you run monetary policy, okay? That is clearly, uh, there are uh, obvious linkages there that macroeconomics theory offers us. And, and therefore, you, you, the idea of developing this oversight mechanism, this excessive deficit procedure, was to uh, make sure that there would not be um, negative externalities from excessive spending, excessive deficit at the national level. Okay, that was this was really criticized in a way, and in a way legitimately so, because they said, okay, what you do, you just have a mechanism monitoring national spending. But you don't really have a mechanism of European Union wide spending, so some sort of a pan European uh, fiscal policy. Uh, I think there is a rationale behind that, is because you need, you first of all probably require a properly working uh, oversight mechanism of national spending before creating a credible um, um, European Union wide fiscal policy. So, where do my work contribute here. My work contribute to the following idea. Um, the way the excessive deficit procedure, this oversight mechanism operating at the supranational level, has been heavily criticized. Um, some scholars said that um, it only worked up to the, um, to the late 1990s uh, because uh, essentially what member states abide by that mechanism in order to get into the euro into the euro to get the euro, and, and then that's it, and then it failed, okay? Um, other scholars said that it, it is ineffective, and uh, other former scholars said actually it is useless, okay? So it's a, it's, it's a failure. Uh, however, uh, the problem is that there are really no, there are really not, there are not a single work that systematically analyze the impact of the oversight of national spending by the European Union on national fiscal outcomes. There is not a single work in the literature that try to assess whether the oversight of national fiscal policy has really had an impact, has really improved fiscal debt discipline at the national level. There is no work. So this is what my work is about. <laughs> so my work is about whether this excessive deficit procedure really had an impact on domestic fiscal discipline. And if you had an impact, that is important because it means that the policy would work and that would lend credibility to a European Union-wide uh, uh, fiscal policy, okay? So that because it means that the oversight, national oversight work effectively and therefore you might want to create then a spending policy at the European level. So that is really what my work is about. My work is that the, the question I want to, I like to address here is does the um, oversight of national budgetary process via the European Union excessive deficit procedure, does it have a significant and large impact on national fiscal discipline? Okay, this is, this is my the question okay. I want to address. Okay, Fabio, so, so now I've, I've got one question. I, I understand now the, the, the importance of the topic. So the idea is whether EU fiscal discipline uh, really works, really exactly. makes uh, national finances more solid. My, my question to you now, I'm curious about this, what mechanisms, what instruments, what weapons does the European Union have in order to enforce fiscal discipline? Well, Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Diego. This is a fantastic question that actually I will plan. I was actually planning to address right now. So you know, you're right on. You know, you're right on, on the on, on the correct point there. That that is a very good question. If you don't mind, before answering this question, I'll um, I'll review the literature on the political causes. Of uh, fiscal indiscipline, of fiscal of, of national spending, 
And then I assess how the excessive deficit procedure works and operates, and to see uh, the features that he has. Uh, and in light of this feature, whether we should expect or not to, you know, that it works and it is effective, whether it would lead to compliance or not. So, 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 that... so you, what you will discuss now is basically about why national governments, if uncontrolled, might be undisciplined. Exactly. Well, exactly. That is exactly the point. So let me very briefly summarize. I mean, what is it that we are trying to analyze here? What is, uh, in a way, what, you know, the scholar will say, what is the dependent variable? Okay, what do we want to analyze? What we want to analyze is fiscal discipline, which is essentially what it is, it is a sustainable balancing of government outlays of expenditure and revenues, okay? So it is a, the sustainable balancing of ex national expenditure and revenues. That was, like, broadly speaking, the definition of fiscal discipline. And the literature um, that studies the political causes of fiscal discipline or lack of fiscal discipline essentially emphasize three mechanisms. And I have to say this literature uh, really focus to a significant extent on Western European countries um, and on OECD countries. So the empirical data that they use are really on Western European countries or OECD countries since the 1970s. Essentially, there are three mechanisms that, that the literature uh, uses in order to explain uh, um, fiscal indiscipline, okay, or, or, fiscal, or, or the lack of fiscal discipline. The first one can be broadly um, characterized as uh, um, fragmentation. So what it means is that uh, uh, the rationale here is, I, I don't know whether the, the students are aware of the concept of the tragedy of the commons, um, which is a, an important principle in the study of, of, of economics. Uh, the, the idea here is the following one, is that uh, um, parties that are in government, a specific policy objective, Okay, they want to spend the policies, and to a significant extent, they want to have a, um, policy spending objectives that benefit their own supporters. Okay, that is that is obvious. And uh, the key aspect here is that they they can successfully shift the blame on coalition partners for other fiscal policy outcomes. Okay, and that is the key aspect. So they have specific spending objectives. That, and they can shift the blame on other fiscal policy outcomes for other, on fellow coalition partners for other spending policies, okay? As a result of this mechanism, uh, uh, spending demand, demand for spending of a specific parties normally fail to fully take into account the cost of these programs, okay? Because everybody relies on a, some sort of a common pool of resources, which is, uh, the amount of money that a government raised by taxation, okay? Also, what is important is that in, uh, in this system, voters normally, you know, tend to reward uh, um, uh, parties uh, by, by the way they spend their money, but they clearly do not distinguish between within party factions, so different factions within a parties. What is the implication of this? The implication of this is that uh, Normally, and this is really a, a rather strong uh, empirical um, um, result in, in the literature, is that normally coalition governments or larger coalitions, which means like coalition with many parties, are generally associated with more public spending. Okay, the public sector is larger in cases of coalition governments or larger coalitions. This is a very solid this is a very solid empirical result okay so Whoever, so so yes. just just let me um, summarize so far you, you, you just said that there is a problem with public spending related to the tragedy of the commons with common resources and that this problem is particularly important in fragmented governments in coalition governments and uh, you come from Italy, it's a country where you are used to having coalition governments. We also have coalition governments in Spain now. We didn't have them always, you know, but they, in the latter period, they usually are coalition governments as well. You, you think that the, the 
this idea you said the blame shifting and that the 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 governments they they just want to share this common pool of of resources of public uh, spending right so you, you, um, and you just said now that this is an empirical uh, regularity that it happens all over all over the world right during the OECD what's this uh, empirical information where does it come from there are a, a fairly long list of studies of work uh, which are, as I said, they are predominantly focused on uh, um, um, on Western European or OECD countries, but there is also some evidence in uh, um, in in studies that cover a larger set of countries. But this result is rather solid for Western European countries, the OECD countries. Okay. But what is important here, what I'm talking about here, is government spending, okay, as a share of GDP. So this is the size of the public sector, which is clearly different for than fiscal discipline, okay? Because you can have a large sector, but you know you have a lot of you have high level of taxations, and hence you are you, you know you are you don't um, you are not you are disciplined fiscally disciplined, okay? Because you spend a lot, you tax a lot, you have a large a large size of the public sector. What is important is that, um, so essentially the implication is, is that a larger public sector does not imply less fiscal discipline. Indeed, studies on not OECD countries and Western European countries, which essentially cover, you know, that extend up to the 1990s, they do report an association between executive fragmentation, as I said, as I just said you, and budget deficits. Okay, so we do find it. The studies that go to the mid 1990s, we do find a relation between executive fragmentation and budget deficits. However, as the study expanding to the 1990s and early 2000s, this association dissipates. Okay. Uh, the most recent studies do not find a relation between executive fragmentations and budget deficits. So that is interesting. Okay, so it's, it, actually it seems to be that it doesn't work anymore since the 1990s. Um, this is the first mechanism. Uh, the second mechanism uh, puts emphasis on budgetary rules. Okay, so what this is telling us is the following one: is that uh, um, if uh, Budgetary powers are centralized in actors that have incentives to internalize the cost of spending, or if there are, if there are constraints on the size of the budgets. I give you two examples. Okay, for instance, let's assume that the Minister of Finance can impose caps on spending to spending ministers. This says you cannot spend more than that. That's it. Okay, or let's assume that. The, when the budget is approved by the parliament, uh, the amending powers of parliamentarians is heavily curtailed. Okay, they can really not amend a lot the budget which is proposed. Okay, in these circumstances, uh, essentially you give a significant amount of power to the uh, minister of finance. Okay, what is interesting is that we do find evidence. Okay. Uh, according to some scholar, uh, they says if uh, uh, there are if there are, if budgetary powers are concentrated in key actors uh, such as the minister of finance, or if, for instance, amending is constrained, political fragmentation does not lead to um, higher spending or uh, more fiscal deficit. Okay, that is that is the impact of budgetary rules. However. If we look at the empirical works, uh, the impact of uh, rules on fiscal discipline uh, since the mid-1990s, essentially, is very consistent. Uh, this uh, interaction between um, uh, executive fragmentations and specific fiscal rule doesn't really work. If there, are, there are works that actually show the exactly opposite outcomes. So this mechanism doesn't seem to play a role, okay? Uh, again, here in especially Western European countries since the 1990s. And then there's a last mechanism, which is proximity to elections. Okay, and, and this is actually a very solid one. 
and this is a very large literature that provides very strong evidence, then uh, um, as governments uh, are getting closer to the elections, uh, they tend to be less, they tend to be, they tend to spend a bit more, or they tend to be less fiscal disciplined, okay? They, they essentially, there is a tendency of fiscal indiscipline as governments get closer to the elections. Okay, let me, let me just, uh, for our students in Romania, uh, what um, Fabio is saying now is that, um, Governments tend to spend more when the elections get close and in, in Romania you can see many examples of this and in fact there was a, a joke by a local there in, in, in Romania because when there were elections they, he, he saw that all the, all the roads were asphalted immediately before the elections and they just said, oh, we should have elections every year <laughs> so, <laughs> so that the road would be perfectly in perfect condition always. Go on. Exactly. That is, that is a very good point, Diego. That is a very good point. And this is, seems to be a very solid, very solid results and still works in the 1990s, 2000s. So this is robust even after the 1990s. Just to give you, you know, a, a feeling of the impact Normally, the, uh, the, def the deficit uh, during the year of, of uh, um, election, when, when you expect any elections, uh, is about uh, half a percentage point, half a percentage point, uh, exactly 0.42% higher in the year of the elections compared to two years prior to the elections, okay? And, you know, half a percentage point of DGP is not a small amount of money. It's a fair amount of money spending. So essentially, the deficit is higher by high half a percentage point at the year. Okay. You know, so, the so, so, so what you are referring to now is what is uh, called the opportunistic uh, business cycle, right? Do, do you exactly. also analyze this idea of the um, partisan uh, political business cycle that left-wing governments tend to be less disciplined than right-wing governments? Uh, there, is, there is significant less um, uh, empirical evidence of that. Uh, there is a very strong evidence of what would, call be, uh, what would be a, a political budgetary cycle. There is strong evidence of that. There is limited evidence that uh, an ideological composition of government uh, necessarily need to uh, more or less uh, fiscal discipline. The evidence is very, very uh, shaky. Um, well, imagine uh, Scandinavian governments, uh, you know, left-wing Scandinavian governments, uh, which have very large public sectors, but they're not really, they're fiscally disciplined. Um, and hence, that is, to, to those governments are well run at the end of the day. They do spend a lot, but, but they, they, they are well run and they are left-leaning. So the evidence is not particularly strong about uh, of what, of the relation between ideology and, and fiscal discipline. But the, the, the electoral cycle has a major impact. And there is a latest work which has been published by Fortunato and Loftis on the American Political Science Review. They actually, they, what they show, they show that the expectations of parliamentary dissolution, which is the same, the expectation of parliamentary solutions has a strong impact on budget deficit. The figure that I told you about 0.42% of deficit over the GDP comes actually from their work. Um, okay, so one, one, one question, one question yeah. about this, about the expectation of parliamentary dissolution. My, my, my question is whether uh, governments tend to spend more before the elections because they want to get ready for those elections and to be re-elected, or they spend more before the elections because they see that they have no chance to be re-elected and they want to spend as much as they can before they leave? Um, so essentially, you, you're asking me whether uh, spending is conditional upon uh, the likelihood of uh, uh, winning the election. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't recall whether the literature has addressed that question. And that's a very interesting question because you would say that uh, 
uh, the parliament is inclined to do so only if uh, it feels that it will lose the election. Um, I, I need to scan the literature to see whether there is empirical support for that. I, I'm not really aware whether that's the case, but that would be an interesting research question. So, so if the students want to do a, a paper on that, they would be welcome to address that point because it's a, it's a very good it's a very good question. Uh, what we do find is that clearly um, uh, fiscal indiscipline increases uh, um, um, across the board. Um, there might be a degree of conditionality there, but it, there is relatively strong evidence that, that, that governments begin to ramp up spending in the expectation of parliamentary uh, dissolution and, and, uh, and, and, and essentially ramp up budget deficit in the expectation of parliamentary dissolutions. And you imagine parliamentary government, this is rather important because uh, uh, parliamentary dissolution is a risk and it occurs. So, so it, it, it is not a, an uncommon risk in parliamentary systems. Um, now, let can I go back now to your question, that you, the question you asked me about whether the uh, international oversight of fiscal policy is uh, uh, effective or not. Okay. So clearly what we do know now is that since 1994, uh, the, the, the Treaty of Maastricht has established an excessive deficit procedure, which is a mechanism to oversee national fiscal policies. And essentially, if there is an excessive deficit, uh, there is a proposal from the Commission to the Council, and the Council establish the existence of an excessive deficit, and it asks a member states to take actions to uh, limit this excessive deficit. Okay, this is how the procedure more or less operates. Okay. And uh, this procedure, uh, uh, since 1994, every country, except for Estonia and Luxembourg, uh, had been deemed excess, the, the deficit of every country, except that of Estonia and Luxembourg, has been deemed excessive at least once, in some cases twice, in other cases three times. Overall, there have been essentially uh, 52 cases whereby uh, 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 the council has said, you know, your deficit is excessive, is excessive. The duration of the procedure has been as short as 10 months, and in some cases has been as long as 10 years. And uh, the shorter case has been uh, Germany, which has been short, you know, 10 months. And Spain has been under supervision for 10 years of the excessive deficit procedure. So, so it has been really lasted for a particularly long period of time. Well, one, just one comment now. Many people are watching on, on YouTube. Thank you very much to uh, all of you for, for watching on, on YouTube. Uh, just a brief me message, propaganda, publicity message for those uh, watching. If you if you like, uh, give a, a like. If uh, if you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. And if you are interested in these videos, uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and now back back to you, uh, Fabio. So the the idea you said that this excessive deficit procedure. I have further questions later uh, about whether this is the only. A mechanism the European Union has now to to enforce fiscal discipline because the European Union has evolved. It has gone through different crises and also has um, increased its arsenal of instruments in order to deal with indisciplined uh, members of the eurozone. Go ahead, please. Exactly, exactly on the point that you made, Diego. This is exactly where I want to land. And and uh, I know there are students, there are international relations students. So this my my um, um, you know my son familiar to international relations students. Um, I imagine that some of you have studied uh, when you study international relations. There is a portion of the literature on international relations which study compliance. Okay, which study um, no three government states. Um, uh, ratify, negotiate treaties, but do they comply with those treaties? And uh, the literature on compliance has essentially two types of schools. The first school is a so-called enforcement school of compliance in international relations, which put emphasis on coercive mechanisms like monitoring and sanctions. 
And there is another school of compliance in international relations, which is called the measurement school of compliance, which put emphasis on capacity building, rule interpretation, transparency, and so on and so forth. Okay? The, uh, according to scholars in IR, what they say that um, you are likely to have higher compliance is you, if you combine, okay, if you combine both mechanisms. If, on the, if you have a, a mechanism of monitoring and sanction, and clearly the, um, the European Union has a mechanism of monitoring and sanction because there's supranational monitoring um, and the supranational monitoring, and then there are ratcheting sanctions if you don't comply with the uh, excessive deficit procedure. I mean, someone might criticize that and might say, you know, it has never been used. Okay, that is correct that it's, it's never been used. But within the Eurozone, um, as, you know, we are aware of the fact that there are negative externalities related to fiscal profligacy, which are sometimes uh, additional sanctions, right? If you have the, uh, not, not, not on the government spending, but on the, on the uh, government being the target of these negative externalities. Uh, because clearly within, within the Eurozone, the transmission of negative externalities of, exce of excessive spending is actually um, um, stronger, uh, it's faster, uh, because um, member states cannot rely on flexible exchange rate to um, protect themselves from the negative externality of excessive spending of whatever, from the implication of contagion in other member states. Okay, So there are, yes, sanctions within the system of excessive deficit procedure, but also, there are strong incentives to abide by this rule for Eurozone member states because of these de facto negative externality with, which, you know, which link fiscal policy with monetary policy, with having a single currency. There are also, I want to emphasize, there are also several aspects in this procedure which address the, um, let's say, the management school of uh, um, international relations, uh, the management school of compliance in international relations. I mean, there are essentially um, a European system of national accounts and regional accounts, which has been established since the 19, uh, uh, early 1990s, but also the, the recurrent reform that you rightly point out, Diego, I mean, the reform in, 19, in 2005, the reform in 2011, and so on and so forth. A lot of them, they have uh, increased the number of obligations of member states. They're delegating more power to the Commission to improve the quality in, of, of statistical data and to, have, to improve transparency, comparability, pre-planning, um, uh, and to avoid really the, uh, uh, the risk of uh, uh, fiscal indiscipline, if, if you can use that term. And therefore, it is a system that I also try to improve, let's say, the interpretation of the rule and to increase transparency. Uh, because a part of the early crisis of the European Union was related to the lack of transparency in, in national fiscal spending. I mean, the, the, the case of Greece, unfortunately, was related to the lack of transparency. There has been significant effort in improving the quality, the transparency and comparability in statistical data. And therefore, what the, the, the issue here is that this system clearly has is, 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 uh, um, combined both the monitoring and sanctioning and coercive aspects with the more problem-solving approach or improving rule interpretation, improving transparency, and so on and so forth. Okay? So what I've done here is that uh, my um, expectation is that the oversight of the excessive deficit procedure does engender a reduction of budget, de of, budget, of budget deficits if countries are members of the Eurozone, okay? So my expectation is that if you interact membership of the Eurozone or expected membership of the Eurozone, let's say the year prior to, the, uh, uh, to being accepted in the Eurozone, if you interact that with the oversight of the excessive deficit, so if you interact two factors, those are likely to have an impact on fiscal discipline. So what I simply did, I replicated the work that I cited there alone by Fortunato and Loftin. I exactly used their data set, exactly the same. Interestingly, they stopped the analysis in 2004, 2006, okay? So they really don't really cover the full 
area of, of when the excessive deficit procedures are operated. So what I did, I extended their, their, um, their uh, time period up to 2019, and I analyzed essentially, I done exactly the same analysis starting from 1993 up until 2019. I use exactly the same sort of data that I've used, the, the, the same of, uh, type of MP, and, and, and independent variables, so, so um, executive fragmentations, uh, budgetary rules, uh, um, expected duration of government uh, to deal with the, um, with the budgetary cycles, with the electoral budgetary cycles, and I replicated their work. But on top of that, I added this interaction between membership of the Eurozone and oversight of the excessive deficit procedure to see the impact of this on fiscal policy. Okay, so now to summarize and to finish what is the broadcast, we will have later a meeting, restricted meeting for, for people registered in this course. But um, is this the conclusion that this EU oversight uh, is more effective in keeping fiscal discipline in the Eurozone than, than outside the Eurozone? Is this the main uh, result? Yes, this is the main result. And I can give you the exact figure. Um, my, my work uh, uh, produced a very similar outcome to, to Fortunato and Lopez, which means that um, in the year of the election, compared to two years prior to election, the deficit increased by 0.43% of GDP. So I actually replicate exactly the same, the, their outcomes. However, what is interesting is that if a government of the Eurozone is under supervision in the full year, the budget is drafted, okay? So, so for instance, let's assume that uh, the, uh, a government is drafting a budget in 2006, okay? Um, and during to, in 2006 is under full supervision of the excessive deficit procedure. The following year, the deficit diminishes by 0.46% of GDP. So it really completely offsets the impact of shortening the expected duration of a government. So if a government is under full supervision in the year that the budget is drafted, it has exactly the same impact <laughs> of shortening the duration of a government, it has exactly the same in impact, but it's negative. Okay, so of course, in that case, the deficit diminishes. Mm -hmm. okay. This is, in my view, it's a very interesting result yes. because it lends credibility to the over to, to overseen fiscal spending, and in my view, it also lends credibility to the creation of to the expansion of EU fiscal capacity. Okay, understood. So it works. This EU oversight uh, works, in particular in, in eurozone countries and. Uh, in particular, when the, there's this full supervision in the year when the budget is drafted. Okay, right. so, but I have now just a final goodbye question to the, our viewers on YouTube on this open broadcast. And this question is more relaxed, you know, Fabio, this is not, you don't have to answer so with so many data or anything. This is just maybe food for thought. It's a question, uh, a broader question. In the EU, very often when I was a student, it was criticized that the EU had a democratic deficit and that the European Parliament was not uh, really able to overcome this uh, deficit because European uh, Parliament elections were not real European elections, they were second-order national elections. My impression now, and just want uh, uh, you to tell me what you think about this. My impression is that in my country, in Spain, I don't know what happens in Italy, national elections are becoming second order European elections. In, 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 in the sense that now people are starting to vote for more radical parties for extremist parties and so on but 
without worries about them because they know they will not really have any power. They know they can vote with the extreme right, they can vote with the extreme left, but in the end, EU discipline will make those governments uh, behave in a more centrist way. Is this the same, the same experience in Italy where you have even elected comedians and clowns as, as leaders of government? And, and I see this is like a common feature in, in, some, in some countries. Is it because people do not take those national elections seriously anymore because they think that the real power are, are elsewhere? Uh I think you know what you said. That there is a, there is an element you know, of to the what you're saying. I think uh, uh, there might be a, a feeling of uh, uh, it doesn't make a difference, uh, and therefore I vote you know whatever you know my my vote has no consequence, and therefore I I will vote you know no matter what I will decide in the last second. And this is a valid point, and uh, um, the last calls are probably. Oh, sorry, you didn't uh, hear me now. I was saying that if uh, we lost connection, we... Uh... Ah, okay, here you are. Okay, Apologies. good. Okay, sorry, sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh... I think it was Skype, Skype, that just uh, disconnected, but it it's working now. Okay. So no, you, I... you, we were finishing anyway, Fabio. So you said that you had a similar impression in Italy? Uh, there is, I think you are right, there is clearly evidence that, that that might be the case in Italy as well. I want to add just one small point to that. We do, however, also have evidence, I mean, part of my work is study even that, that actually ministers in the council do pay attention, however, to their own public opinion when they take positions and they negotiate issues at the European level. So, you know, uh, your government matters. <laughs> What the go your government thinks and, and uh, um, matters because it is powerful in Europe and also it does pay attention to public opinion uh, at the national level. Um, so so uh, I think you're right in saying that, uh, but, but there is evidence that government seems to be responding to public opinion when they take position at the European Union level. Uh, we do have evidence of that. Uh, but um, the, 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 the point that you raise is, is a problematic point that, that uh, it might be a concern for the future. So I do, I do see that that could be a concern for the future. Okay, let's, let's bring this to a close uh, publicly on, on YouTube, broadcast uh, openly on, on, on YouTube, and we'll continue now on Zoom, restricted. I, I, with all the students that are registering this course, they already got the link. So I'll see you all on, on Zoom now. And if uh, Professor Fabio Franchino wants to say hello to you and answer some of your questions, he will be able to do this by, by Zoom. Thank you, Fabio, again, for your presence and participation today. And uh, I, I, I hope to see you around more often. Goodbye, everyone. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.